Yeah, okay, so good afternoon everyone um, and welcome to the fourth episode of SCM Talk Show Season 3. The last episode was on why AI supply chain projects fail and this episode on changing paradigm of global supply chains. It's going to be a very interesting topic today and topics as you know we choose from the responses that we get uh, you know, for the survey that we have sent to you and also based on the availability of good speakers. As Nistush informed, we are going to record this session and this session will be made available uh, you know, on our YouTube channel and also Novax mobile app. And similar to our usual practice of this SCM talk show, we put everyone into listen only mode. So if you have any questions, you know, you can put in the chat box. You don't have to wait till the end. You can put the question as and when you get the questions in your mind. But depending on the availability of time at the end, we will take selected questions. So that's uh, basically uh, is about the talk show arrangement. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce today's professor, uh, our speaker professor V. G. Venkatesh. Dr. Venkatesh is an associate professor of supply chain management and logistics area, and has joined E. M. Normandy in 2019. He has a PhD in Global Sourcing and Sustainability from the New University of Waikato, New Zealand. His research interests are procurement, logistics, infrastructure and sustainability. He has a consistent publication record with reputable journals and industry publications. He is certified supply chain professional CSCP with ASCM USA and having 20 years of academic and industry experience across different geographies such as Honduras, Sri Lanka, Hong Kong, Bangladesh, and New Zealand. A qualified trainer and lifetime chartered member of Institute of Logistics and Transport, a member of a reputable associates such as Council of Supply Chain Management Professionals and International Association of Maritime Economists. He is also a senior associate with Nextport, LATAM, an advisory group in Latin America. His name appears in the recent select list of global level influencer scholars on social media around responsible business areas proposed by the University of Bath UK. So this list is Think Amplify list. He is currently a visiting faculty to leading business schools in different parts of the world, including India, Spain and Sweden. So welcome Dr. Venkatesh. Thank you sir. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to associate with uh, Norax always. Yeah. Thank you. It's our pleasure too and thanks for accepting our invitation to share your practice oriented insight with our listeners. Absolutely. So I think so you are in France right, uh, right now. Yeah. And coming from EU background, can you please share the significant changes you see in global supply chains? OK, so that's an interesting area to uh, share my knowledge because I am I have been closely following up EU's supply chain strategy and perhaps like uh, extending its strategy towards like you know, uh, you know global uh, business. Very closely I follow the changing orders. Okay, uh, one of the recent happenings which is changing the entire uh, uh, global trade space with respect to European Union is the Brexit. Brexit is like, you know, uh, it's a big, big um, move for both the, not only UK, it is like, uh, it is a big, I would say a strategic move for EU also. Um, all the while, EU is considered to be the uh, labor force supplier to UK. Okay, so what is happening here is like uh, now, because of the Brexit, US has sorry UK has imposed uh, many uh, stricter norms in terms of visa in terms of like uh, moving the trucks across border kind of thing so there are like many uh, obstacles for like uh, european based logistics service providers to serve the uk space so what is happening here is like we don't get i mean uk people they don't uh, offer a long term visa to the european union people they it's a work permit kind of thing okay 
So because of that, what is happening here is like the truck drivers, they are also not having the like permit to enter into the like you know, UK and drive along the UK kind of. They have to get the permission actually. It has to go through a proper or like a structured process. Okay. And also they position the customs across both the borders kind of thing to check like you know, whether it is coming like uh, incoming goods, outgoing goods or good or bad kind of thing. Okay, so this also delayed like uh, the lots of movements like you know, in both the uh, borders. Okay, so uh, coming, coming back very specifically to the uh, Brexit area uh, because of the reduced opportunities the, the European Union truck drivers they shifted to other professions now that means like you now the European Union itself is not getting the enough number of drivers which is like you no know, which is a big backbone of like because European is completely landlocked area many land much of there are lots of landlocked countries so we have a big problem in like you know, serving the different nations. So our supply chains are breaking. Actually, like you know, it is invisible and it is in like shuttle effect. Very, very, you know, um, but uh, the long term impact has to be seen after 24, 25. That means 2024, 20, 25, we will come to know that how it is going to really impact the performance of the internal European Union supply chains. OK. So predicting that the European Union, what they have done is like uh, they already cautioned many countries that are, such as China and uh, India, uh, they don't want to like you know, rely on them. They wanted like you know, to establish themselves as a manufacturing hub. That means European Union traditionally a consumption country. So they wanted to like you know, establish themselves as uh, uh, as a what do you say like a you know, manufacturing hub but unfortunately western europe is expensive that means it's a very very expensive okay so the their focus is shifting towards the eastern european countries such as hungary starting from poland poland is traditionally considered the manufacturing country so like uh, so poland hungary uh, you know the russian borders kind of thing belarus all these countries like you know, will come into the picture okay so uh now, because of this pandemic, again, like that, that, that uh, entire strategy has been delayed and on top of it, salt to the wound uh, because of the Ukraine and Russia war, the strategy is also getting like, you no know, delayed now. But their long term strategy, if you see that like you know, next to four to five years, they are trying to cut down the reliance on like you know, India, uh, India and China for many products. I'm openly saying this, OK, because already Angela Merkel, who was the ex president of like you know, Germany, she was like you no know, cautioning the global world in a different word, saying that like you no know, too much dependence on India for the pharma supply is not good. So in, in India was like you know, supplying the vaccines to the whole world like you no know, she was pointing out like because she could not get any supply from China so she was entire thing was relying on India like because India has a huge supply base so she was cautioning to the European Union in Brussels to meet she was cautioning that and finally like you no know, the European Union has adapted you know they, really they have given a thought on that and they wanted to like drive this manufacturing uh, oriented uh, what is a business in the coming years. So that is the big, big uh, change which is happening in the European Union right now. And of course, like, you know, in down the year, like three to four years, we may have a big problem in like getting the logistics drivers, even though if you are producing all of us are from supply chain background, even though if you are producing quality goods on time, if you are unable to make the goods available at the right place, and at the point of consumption, definitely it is going to be a big uh, mess in the supply chain. So now like the challenge is to sustain the logistics truck drivers, uh, you know, carrier and also like, you know, to uh, what you say, like give them certain incentives and uh, packages to retain them and uh, uh, and establish like no separate category like you know like skill labor category main, focusing on only on the truck driver so european union has noted down that and this effect 
is there in india as well i know like you know i have recently read that and in fact we have also done small research on that still uh, you know in uh, the, the the entire logistics industry is like you know very very easy go on this but unfortunately like the effect is going to be seen very soon you know like very soon 2024 25 we will come to know even like i'm telling you even we are pay, if we are paying like you know 60000 euros which is a huge salary here we are not getting the container drivers good container drivers like you know reefer container drivers big 53 foot containers we don't get it here so that is the major problem here so coming back to the second issue which i am seeing is uh, like um, the, in the global reorder european union is going to like a uh, cut down like uh, the uh, uh, lots of operations uh, from china but though it shows that like uh, you know inclination they are not uh, showing explicitly their opposite stand on Uh, um, you know chinese uh, policy and everything but still like uh, you know uh, they have some crucial supply to be maintained from china but at the same time you know you you might have seen the recent talks from like you know, european union president ursula von der leyen she visited india for the rising conference and she wanted to take a strategic partnership with the india to boost up like you know their you know uh, uh, trade trade tie ups actually european union is shifting the focus from you know china to like you know, india so india has uh, the chance the huge chance to capture the like the space of china that is what like now i'm seeing it yeah and of course like you now the third i third uh, thing which i can think about is like now everyone knows about like the dominance of us okay so like recently in um, uh, there is a huge cry, you know cry out in the global business india is paying in rubles uh, on russian currency and getting the oil that means like india is like a cutting down the dependence on the dollar payment so they, there is a huge cry from us and g7 countries that india is shifting the india is disrupting the global payment systems kind of thing but definitely like you know this is not the initiative from india uh, in the current situation it has been trying from 2018 onwards okay to cut down the reliance on the us dollars and to like make the payments according to the like you know buying countries currency so like uh, so this is also going to be a big challenge in the global market and the us is really annoyed i'm telling in a different way so they wanted to like you know show their dominance but uh, like uh, none of the country it is not getting the huge support from like the rest of the world except the top countries like like, like uk uk always wants to show the power because the brexit they lost like you know certain like uh, the space in this global trade so they wanted to show their presence by being aggressive in russian ukraine war and like you know many other things they wanted to show the uh, you know presence so they are showing always aggressive if you if you carefully watch the global trade uk is the first to want to react to all the sanctions and everything russian sanctions uk was the first one to put the sanctions okay so uk wants to show the presence and they wanted to project themselves hi we are there kind of thing you know you have to consider as kind of so but unfortunately this will not sustain for long time because the us also uk also rely many things from eu for its supply and africa for its supply so definitely it is not going to remain for long yeah so my my take is the western powers will show their decline and obviously they are showing now but like you know this, there will be a significant decline on the voice of the western power countries like india countries like you know vietnam will emerge and they have a huge say in terms of changing the global order dynamics thank you professor venkatesh so from what you said what are changes the expectations in expectations from suppliers with current scenario okay fantastic sir uh all of us know the inco terms right in the inco terms like you know we have a big Uh, uh, you know 11 terms and like you know fob and many of the businesses were taking place earlier on fob based that means like you know uh, you know i will take if i am a brand i am taking care of the logistics okay uh, 
Uh, unfortunately, like you know, I am I'm, I'm seeing a big change in the like you know in the space. So what they like you know, big corporations like L'Oreal or Johnson and Johnson from European Union, what they wanted from the supplier is they wanted suppliers to be like you know, proficient not only in produ producing the particular uh, uh, product as a manuf contract manufacturer, they wanted suppliers to involve in designing the product, designing the product, testing the product, and even they wanted to work very closely. You rem uh, like you, know, you remember like the Walmart is the first one to propose the CPFR, collaborative planning, forecasting, replenishment, how they worked closely with the uh, you know different suppliers across the world. So that concept is going to be in in a phenomenal growth, you know, after this pandemic and also uh, in the coming years. So it will have like you no know, multiple effects in terms of like you know, participating in demand management of these buyers from the supplier side. That means suppliers are going to have their own representatives or their own teams who will be working for demand management function of the buyers kind of thing. So they have a separate team. They will be working closely with the buyers sitting in Vietnam or sitting in, in India. That is happening right now, but this will have like you know, huge demand. This profession will have get into you know, uh, focus uh, in the coming years. Um, another thing I wanted to talk about is like uh, in, the, in terms of logistic space, uh, the INCO terms like the landed duty paid is the most preferred one instead of like, you know, FOB because like, you know, if I give the responsibility to my manufacturer, I expect them to participate in right from the designing to like, like, like a full package service, basically. Like now I'm going to no. give them a full package service and they are participating in all uh, decisions in the supply chain. I give them like you know, $10 per product. It, in, it is inclusive of everything. And so they have to take care of the last mile delivery as well. So I am seeing like, you know, increasingly suppliers are also searching for like, you know, warehouse operations across European Union and different places in US kind of thing. That means like they wanted to contract out the warehouse spaces kind of thing. Earlier, it was not like that. They move the goods to the buyer's place through their like, you know, third party, uh, like, um, um, uh, uh, third party organization kind of thing, right? So like uh, now it is ha they are having their own, uh, they wanted to have their own warehouse space. So whenever the buyer is asking the particular product or replenishing the particular request has come, replenishment request has come from the buyers, you can always transfer or you can always like, you know, um, place the goods for the consumption points. So that is what like, you know, it's expected. So the many of the suppliers, they're expected to have like a warehouse space, even if it is their, if it's not their own, they are expected to have their, uh, what do you say, like contract spaces, contract warehouse space kind of thing. So many of them like, you know, uh, they are looking for it, you know, warehouse partners nowadays. Yeah. Thank you. So that is what I like. Yeah. yeah. So one question I have this post pandemic, I think a lot of countries want to re reduce dependency on you know other countries right as you have mm -hmm. been talking about europe and america and even india Atmeber, bharat and i think brexit yeah. and so on so forth yeah so yeah. is it the end of globalization that we were talking about for so many years or is it um you know so what is it going to be in the future that's a that's a uh, very very pertinent question which is running in my mind for a long time um, are we going to say like an you know, end of globalization? Uh, to me, like the word globalization may be rested for some time, you know, like, you know, they, it's called a regionalization. We call it as regionalization now. And also the new word which is coming up in the global trade that is called as French shoring. Near shoring, Agia, now French shoring, friend, friend. Friend, Hamara friend. Oh, friend, not French. You know, you know, French shoring, okay. Um, uh, what is happening here is like uh, if I am if I am doing the business in, in India, so I look for a partner who I am not looking for a partner in China, and because of China I don't want to do the business. Uh, rather, like no, I will look for a partner who is like, having a great uh, you know service to me from a friendly countries. I uh, means in terms of global trade kind of thing. I will look right. for those countries. 
and which is like uh, easy to do the trade kind of. So the French sourcing, we will have a list like, you know, first list, category one, category two, category three kind of thing. One of my students is working on that project actually. So it, it is not only by the ease of, uh, what do you say, like uh, ease of doing the business with them. So it is based on like the fact of how were they, uh, how were they like uh, getting the support in terms of logistic space kind of thing. Say example, I'm going to give an example, okay. Uh, in US, during the pandemic, during the pandemic, what is happening here is that all the containers at the, are locked at the West Coast. That means Long Beach had a big problem in terms of releasing the container. And because of that, uh, uh, you know, um, the stalemate, the, the, the federal government has introduced a system of 24 into 7 operating. The port can operate 24 into 7. That was very new to them. That was very, very new. Port doesn't operate in Long Beach. That doesn't operate in 24 into 7. Okay, that is what like, you know, uh, uh, in the traditionally. Uh, now the labor union is like, you no, know, trying to adjust it. Like, you know, they wanted like, you know, some, um, uh, what do you say, like uh, allowances and everything. So they were unable to like, you know, cope up that pressure. And also this year, like 2021, there is a change in the labor contract, means it's a negotiation year. So they are trying to like negotiate with the state government as well as the federal government for like you no know, revision in the salary. So it is not only the pandemic effect, on top of it, the change in the labor union is also like, you know, uh, you know um, uh, uh, labor union policy and their demands also cost the like you know container uh, movements. It's uh, everyone is talking about like you know uh, uh, okay container has been locked because like uh, they have a pandemic issue over there and they have fear and it's not like that actually the IWA International Warehouse Labor Union or uh, Union has that uh, like you know which is leading the uh, the dialogue uh, you know has a problem over there so they already cautioned. So if you carefully watch like, you know, the Amazon or uh, Amazon when they took the like, you know, uh, the shipments from like uh, China on a chartered trip, they were diverting the like, you know, the entire ship to the smaller port, not to the Long Beach because they they know that the, small, the big ports like Long Beach and all is going to create a major problem in terms of like you know, container clearance. So they're very smart way. So that is why I'm telling you like the, so the globalization uh, is kind of like it is going to be rested. The word is going to be rested. And it doesn't mean that like uh, to me, like when, when we come to know about like an Atman Nirmar Bharat, it doesn't mean that like uh, we are, we don't want other nations. It doesn't mean that I'm telling you like you know, very, very, it is all about leveraging our own strength. Got it? What I'm saying like it is, it is, it is, it is the kind of platform to show our manufacturing capability. It is not to demean other collaborations. Please listen carefully. This is what I have understood. I have like, you know, read the article, many of the articles. It doesn't mean that like, you know, we want to stop the business doing the business with others. No, never. It is not the policy of our government. I'm telling you openly. So it is the kind of intention what they wanted to reveal to the external world saying that we have also got the manufacturing capability come and invest on us, you know, in on us so that like, you know, we can export it like, you know, the Mac in India export it to the rest of the world. That is the one. The people on the other side, the political space may create a different story on this. But as a like, supply chain professor, I have decoded in this way so that like, you know, uh, uh, you know, it is a big, big move for India as well, because in order to capture the absence of Chinese manufacturing space, so we will get more opportunities. We are getting already. We are getting. It's not like that. We are we are getting it at the same time. There are some geopolitical issues like Ford has exited from our country. So that is the, that is that if you if you decode it, if you carefully observe it, there must be some political reasons behind in it or like you know, trade issues behind in it. But on the whole, the government policy is such a way that we wanted to project India as a huge manufacturing capable nation or like the sourcing hub kind of thing. So knowing that space, Angela Merkel made a comment, don't rely on India kind of thing. So like, you know, and on top of it, like, you know, European Union on the whole, they don't, they know that like, you know, if we don't get the you know supplies from India, then we don't have like, you no know, 
huge uh, supplies from other sources kind of thing. So they wanted, it is a double standard kind of thing. So they wanted to maintain the relationship so that like, you know, India can be used at any point of time kind of thing. So, so Western world works in a different manner altogether. You know, like they have a, they will tell one story here, the same story in another way. They will tell India not to buy uh, oil from India, oil, sorry, oil from Russia. Uh, but they buy around like you know, 40 to 50 percent, 60 percent oil still from Russia in a different manner, you know. So like, you no, know, they they work in a different manner. Actually, they always try to point out like, you no, know, uh, India, uh, India are like you know, emerging economies are the major scapegoats to spoil this like, you know, globalization kind of thing. Now it's time for us to show the regional powers, you know. That's why I said, like, you no, know, put the word side globalization or global, uh, you know, uh, you know, for some time. So regionalization, regional hubs are going to gain prominence in coming years, three to four years, and once after that, they will be integrated into the global business. So, but it will be a temporary. It will be very, very temporary. You know. That's very, very interesting. Thank you so much. So, very uh, one very interesting question that I have is. What are the critical roles of China and India as Asian superpowers? Who is going to gain leverage out of the situation? Okay, fantastic question. I one word answer. I would say that India is going to gain the you no know, advantage. If I say like that, I have like some reasons behind it. Let me talk about the reasons. Number one. Yes, China is getting into many controversies. I'm not like you no know, uh, the uh, geopolitical professor, but like whatever understanding I have it in the global trade, I will put it in very very straightforward comment. Okay, China is under still under like you no know, many many controversies. For example, the current crisis, what they claim in if you happen to uh, watch Wyan TV, nine o'clock gravitas. Every eight o'clock gravitas, right? In time somewhere I watched like her. So yeah. gravitas. Every show, Palki and Monica Gambir, they make it a point to talk about China as like you know one of the issues. That means one clip will be there. You you carefully watch it because that should, that is true actually. One point of time like you no, know, it is true. Why? Because China. You, they have like you no know, that uh, what do you say like the sweatshops they are huge sweatshops they don't pay very well in, traditionally they don't pay very well because they wanted to like maintain as the cost low cost sourcing kind of thing but unfortunately the labor uh, labor got like what do you say like uh, the unrest and everything so they have revamped the system the labor cost like been changed so now what is happening here is like they had to pay you know high prices to the labor uh, um, uh, wages. So what is happening? It is also becoming an what do you say like you no know, expensive sourcing hub. Okay, what expensive sourcing hub. Second thing is their like you no know, import and export law is not that friendly. You know, got what I'm saying? Like you no, know, they have lots of rules and regulations, uh, stringent regulations compared to India, compared to Asian countries, like, you no, know, they have got a stringent rule still. Like, for example, during the pandemic, they shut down the entire Shanghai port, which is like, you know, one of the top three ports of the world. Like, you know, the global supply chain has broken. They should have thought, you know, like, uh, you know, before breaking the uh, entire global supply chain. Still, you see that like you know, there are many problems in like you know, receiving the containers, empty containers from China. My own friends from the industries like you know, still they say that like uh, the traffic price between the China and the US is still, uh, you know, 13,000 USD. Like you know, from 21,000 was there, now it is coming down to 13,000 to 14,000. It is there. Still, it is costly, right? Because of that, like the global supply chains are facing big problem. So we you know the, the countries, the business countries which are doing the business. Are, are you know very very keen to look for other manufacturing sources such as like Vietnam, India, Egypt. So what they do is like you know they are trying to shift the production not only to like you know, India. Even they know that if I put the like you know India into the map, it is a big risk. Say for example. Wheat production suddenly the government has changed the rule like you no know, you can't ship you know kind of thing India so they wanted to like uh, cut down that means like you know the split the quantities into the multiple sources and one of the countries I feel for U.S. business 
uh, you know, it is going to emerge as a huge manufacturing or prominent manufacturing hub is Mexico or Central America. Earlier it was there due to the space, uh, you know, due to the proximity to the like uh, uh, consumption hub, but they were having a huge problem to get the raw materials uh, from like you know, different places. So now Central American countries, including Mexico, are focusing on building their capacity in terms of raw material supply so that they can manufacture the products. 10 years back when I was there in the industry, 10, 15 years back and when I was in the industry, uh, you know, the, the same space I'm talking about Central America where I worked, we were increasingly depending on raw materials from China and in India. When I was, I'm coming from a soft line background, I had to depend on my fabric to come from all the way from India and China. We they don't have a manufacturing base there. So the raw material hub is absent in Central America. So now it is not going to be like that. Like, you no, know, they are trying to, uh, focus on building the raw material supply capability within the like you know Central American hub kind of thing. So there are like you no know, lots. Now if we, if those things are happening, you now Chinese reliance will come down. You know, got it? What I'm saying? Like you now Chinese reliance will come down. So uh, you know, of course, like you know India because of its like uh, friendly global trade norms. And also second thing is like, you know, India is very outspoken in terms, it's not a closing the everything, you know, it is always willing to negotiate the global trade dynamics with the partner countries. Like you know, it is actively participating in Davos and WTO dialogues, like, very active. India is very active. And one of the articles uh, from Observer Research Foundation, I read it, India is going to be the emerge you know, emerging power altogether. You know, everyone looks at Indian decision. If you see that, like you know, our uh, uh, Dr. Jay Shankar's, like one of the best, uh, you know, I would say the foreign ministers we had in, in our Indian history. To, he's outrightly spoken that you, know, you guys spend like you know, money on like you no know, um, uh, Russian buying, and if we buy our 10% buying from Russia, like you, know, you are scolding us kind of, you do all the activity. So he was outright and he was like, uh, uh, you know, putting that blame, <laughs> blatantly he was putting the blame to like you know, Western power, okay. So definitely like, you know, these are all like noticed very, very carefully by the Western power, okay. So it's not like that. I read a lot of article from the, in the French also. So they, French is always Indian, in, Indian friendly. That means like they don't want to like not take a, um, you know, anti-stand with India because uh, they, uh, they have, they see that like a, traditionally they have a, a friendly policy within India. So they wanted to continue with that. So uh, like that, so like China, reliance will come down but like at the same time india should not undermine chinese power because their uh, population is we we always undermine them that they don't speak in english okay okay but it's not so they speak good english the young generation speak very good english very good us accent so you have to appreciate that like you know their their young generation is like picking up very fast and if you go to like, you know, any country in Europe or like, uh, you know, you, on that matter, like New Zealand or like, uh, you know, Africa or in US, the Chinese population is like, you know, growing like anything. OK, it's not like Indian population it is growing like anything. And if especially in Africa, they are like, you know, putting the investments like a left, right center and they are forcing the country to be in the debt trapped countries for like, you know, uh, all poor like uh, uh, African nations. So we cannot undermine the like the power of Chinese investments and the Chinese long term strategy. OK, so the, I, I, I'll, I'll stop here like but I, I definitely like you no know, India is going to take the advantage. Yeah, I would say that. Yeah. Sir, you are on mute. I guess. I'm in mute. Yeah, thanks, Professor. Thank you so much. So can you please bring on recent movement, uh, some moves or projects in logistics industry that are disruptive at a very macro level, not at a macro level, but at a very macro level? Yeah, thank you, sir. Like uh, you see, um, there are many things which are happening in the uh, 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 industry. Like you now, one thing which is uh, going to be disruptive uh, is the blockchain technology. OK, so blockchain uh, earlier we think that it is only for cryptocurrency, financial movements and everything. 
and there are like you know many many research even myself i do the like uh, you know my intense research in terms of building the new modules with the blockchains and uh, how to track their like you no know, uh, uh, what do you say uh, cost details and also energy details energy consumption details so we go to the extent of tracking the uh, all the components all the possible components so like you know one of the disruptive technologies or one of the disruptive like you know strategies which is going to rule in the coming years is the definitely it is the blockchain technology that means i will put it under the broad category of digital technologies okay so uh, then and in um in the firm wise disruptive movements i would say that uh, many of the companies they wanted to like uh, do the vertical integration that means like uh, for example i will put it like you know uh, i will take an example from amazon itself okay amazon during the pandemic yes they were maintaining or they were sustaining the supplies in us and other continents definitely i should say them like you know they were trying their best okay now people might be wondering all the countries are having the problem all the countries all the shipping, shipping lines are having their own their problem how come amazon alone is doing their services with less disruption okay so they were always asking the question so when i researched on them definitely like you know the amazon was keen or like you know, they were interested to invest on like you no know, in the maritime logistics that means like you know they they sponsored container buying that means like a container they focused on container buying and also they focused on like having the charter strips I, as i told like you know just before like few minutes i was talking about they like you know they took a charter trips on a smaller vessels like 600 TUs to like you know 1200 T 1000 TUs vessels and they sail to like you know the smaller ports so this is a like you know big strategy which they have shown to like because they they were increasingly a uh, e-commerce company and they were like you know doing only the last mile delivery but they were not having the presence in terms of international logistics okay so this is a big disruptive moment for like logistics industry you guys like the bigger players are coming in you know to fight and to eat up your share okay another thing i wanted to tell this like amazon is like you know developing the the air cargo also they they went venture into the air cargo also so when they are developing the air cargo what happens is they focused on not the bigger airports like you know washington dc or new york kind of thing instead they focused on very small airports which are in the middle country mid countries kind like mid country space kind of thing so they wanted to develop that airports as a cargo hub kind of thing so these are all some of the strategies which is like you no know, suddenly like you know it is appearing out of the blue nobody has thought about that but it is suddenly appearing in the big disruptive movement in terms of logistics of course the, on the other side maritime companies such as musk if you see that like traditionally they were like you no know, container moving companies and they were they were giving the services through their like you know, in the past they were having a separate arm called damco damco was doing their third party logistics now damco is no more mers logistics itself is doing integrated services but mers logistics didn't have their own air logistics division now they bought like you no know, two airline companies in europe and they wanted to finish the deal like in this year they will finish the deal and they wanted to enter into the airline air cargo business as well to compete with like you no know, big guys like you no know, dhl and uh, the like uh, fedex kind of thing they wanted to be. and and amazon in one of the reports i have seen it they don't want to like you no know, start the business to show the company as like you no know, competitor to musk or any other integrators they wanted to like you no know, collaborate with them that's what they say that you know amazon wants to collaborate with musk amazon wants to collaborate with fedex kind of thing so so it is a kind of like a space where we are getting into the collaborative mode from the bigger guys not from the smaller guys bigger guys itself like you know, as like you know, some of you are from the ocean freight industry you might be knowing that uh, three alliance alliance three or like you know major alliances shipping alliances are there where they all the three alliances come together shipping lines like cma cma cgm 
and uh, like uh, Musk and Yangling, what uh, it it changes very often. Like you know, every now and then it changes. But like you know, big shipping lines, they form a shipping alliance and they share their capacity, they share their lines and everything. Like your airlines have the code share kind of thing. So same thing here, right? Like so, but. Company wise integration, we have not seen it, right? Like a manufacturing or like company wise. Interest. So that is going to be very prominent very soon. You know, that is what I'm saying it. Yeah, going by the trend. So one question I have is on this uh, green thing, you know, which all the European countries, Western countries push and they they promote. What is your take on that? It's a big, you know, it's a big question to debate, but like um, European Union is uh, very, very powerful uh, in terms of driving this agenda into reality. OK, so I would say that it is the first block, major trading block, which focused on like you know, green. That means when they say green, they try at least like you know, if it is not 100 percent, at least like you can see the significant effort to reduce the carbon emission kind of thing. Whereas in other countries, if you see that they oh, namke vaste bhi ho jata. You know, sometimes like you no know, namke vaste for record level, like you know, that is the kind of ethics uh, you no know, other countries are having it. But European Union very, very strict with that. And by doing that kind of uh, what do you say, like uh, operational uh, uh, changes with the integrity, so they could achieve their targets. That means they are very, very close to their target. Whatever 2030 targets they could they could achieve. It. They are very close to achieving the target. But whereas the you know countries like India, they are like you know, really pushing hard. That means the Western power is really pushing hard on India and China because these people they think that these are all they are all the pollutants, major pollutants. Of course, like you know, India is pollutant country. I mean, we should not rely, I mean, we, we should not deny that, but significant pollution comes from Western nations also. You got it, I mean, so but they don't uh, like you no know, hi, uh, hyped or they don't like you no know, projected, but they put the blame on to only to the emerging nations, emerging economies like China and India, Vietnam kind of thing. Because why I understood that because they wanted to cut down the cost. By bulke bulke, like you know, cut down the cost negotiation. That means psychologically they are forcing you into the corner, and we don't want to give the order, but we will be giving the order kind of thing. You got it? What I'm saying? Like uh, so, it's a kind of uh, you know psychological pressure. They are trying to do that, but definitely like you know, with the 1.35 billion population in countries like India, as well as like you know, 1.6 billion population countries like China, they are doing their best. To cut down the like you no know, carbon emission and recent coal crisis, you can see that like you know, how much um, yeah, huge hue and cry in, in India as well like you no know, because that was the pressure from Western community to reduce the coal consumption. What is happening here is like you know China and Australia they had a like you no know, tie up in terms of coal import. Okay, coal doesn't have like you no know, China doesn't have like you no know, huge coal supply, so they had to take it from like an you know, Australia. So now like you know, it has been banned. So like you know, we don't want to give because you are polluting the environment. So there is big dialogue is going on between a China, a China and Australia kind of thing. Similarly, in India also, like you not know, trying to reduce their coal imports, um, you know, or like their coal production, like you know, as much as possible, and uh, they don't want to like you know rely on the coal energy. So they are trying to reduce as much as possible. If you see that you know recent, very recent um, um, comment from like uh, U.S. Deputy Secretary of the Energy, so he claims that India is going to be the major major energy supplier of the world. I don't know what I have to read through the report, read through in between the lines, read in between the lines. What made him to talk about that? You know, so I had to literally analyze on that. But he made a simple comment saying that um, uh, uh, <laughs> India is going to be the huge energy supplier. You know, so I had to do that. Of course, there is a like a you know, lot of things we need to do um, progressively in terms of giving um, more labor facilities and everything still we are like uh, yeah, into some some practices which are into the age old practices um, uh, we, sh we should like appreciate that lots of MNCs when they come to India they bring some practices to India which was slightly disruptive uh, um, for some companies in, in India we were we, they were doing traditional practices but now like they are started 
focusing on employees safety health issues as well which is a positive sign it's a cultural change it will not happen like you know 10 years kind of thing so it will take its right, own right. time kind of thing yeah so uh, you you talked about atmir bharat a little bit and then you know i would like to also know what is your comment on make in india project so do you think what should be the road map under the global pressures so um i i definitely feel that like you know um, india has to like you know in, in in terms of from india i am an indian so i still indian passport holder so like you now i talk from the indian perspective okay so uh, india as i said india has a huge uh, uh, you know um, opportunity now like uh, I, i feel that like you know the our top management or like you know the rulers they should understand uh, like uh, how to tackle the western powers yeah western powers the way like you know as i said like uh, only the ministry of external affairs is doing the best job in terms of like countering the western powers unfortunately if you happen to interact with the main, my french colleagues or like you know other uh, uh, you know the professors from other countries they say like you know india's finance is not great okay so like you know that if you see if you core finance they will say that the core finance because we are still uh, uh, we are having the 7.79 inflation right and also there are like you no know, four nations have been identified as sorry four states have been identified as the uh the states going to be having a problem i i believe like in assam punjab and chatisgarh or like i don't know like uh, fourth one i don't know the four states have been identified so they started highlighting it if india started like you no know, breaking like uh, on focusing on like they they managing their own uh, needs kind of thing the global supply on the global supply side or on global trade side they may get a negative impact that means they they they, they don't get the huge business kind of thing so they are already cautioning in my own economics professors they are already cautioning it so india has got its own problem for example i'll tell you like in you know, a wheat production okay wheat traditionally they ha- it has to come from like you know ukraine and russia india was like you no know, seventh or eighth largest exporter india was not at all in the picture now okay india was like not at all in the picture now what is happening here is every country's focus is on in india please remove your export ban kind of thing now like india is very smart what they did is like you know they identified the the huge need of like you know egypt that means like you know when egypt is the the country major country which is uh, importing the uh wheat from russia and ukraine and because like the supply is not there they are going to have a huge food crisis so india is so select india is very smart india is so selective to like you know continue their supply with egypt but for the rest of the world they don't want to supply kind of thing so like you know india india has made that kind of like you no know, exim uh, rule like you no know, uh, embargo kind of thing so this kind of pressures now in every country is like you know asking india to limit or like uh, you know li- sorry lift the ban so india is not succumbing to the pressure i'm telling you india will not succumb to the pressure i know that like you know india will not succumb to the pressure because india traditional because one um, the uh, the, uh, the what is it the, the overall production wheat production is not uh, Uh, achieving uh, it's not achieving its target second india has understood that like you no know, uh, uh, western uh, what do you say like influence on this decision so they don't want to like you know go by the decisions from western you know you have to like you know lift it at, and they don't want to be uh, the what do you say like uh, um, the, the trump card or like uh, uh, and the word i would say that what is that there is there, i forgot that word they don't want to be the like a uh, uh, toy in the hands of like uh, you know western powers so they they are very very strict they said like we don't want to like you know do that kind of thing some of the you know some of the um, uh, what do you say like uh, rules or some of the policies of like the rulers uh, uh the current rulers as well as the previous rulers were very strong it has been like uh, kept like you know very strong from india so kudos to like you know all the people who have been like you know traditionally following this non alignment movement nam so like you now i'm 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 seeing that we are still like you know sticking on to that in uh, in some format yeah we are not sidelining to like you know, any of the powers just like that yeah. great great thanks for your inputs 
So I'll slightly deviate now from the topic uh, on supply chain analytics. So okay. Do you think that a new topic that is supply chain analytics, which is coming up very fast? Yeah. How the large conglomerate uh, conglomerates will receive it? What is your okay. take on this okay. from both academic and practitioners' perspective? Thank you, sir. Like uh, you know, uh, that's a uh, that's always a debatable question. And my friends from data analysis uh, department, I hope they are not there. Like okay, so I'm going to have a very very straightforward comment. Uh, which is going to hit them very badly, but uh, that is true. OK, OK, we as supply chain professionals, we are not going to like a process. Uh, we are not going to process the data and we are just just going to like, you know, understand the data kind of thing. We are need to interpret the results. That means we need to understand like you know, how the results are going to make an impact. We need to make some decisions out of it. OK, so when my own students in the MBA, MBA programs, they ask for it. Can I do some like you know, MBA data analytics? Can I do like some like you no know, MBA supply chain analytics course? I mean, some some courses related to supply chain analytics. I ask them one question how good you are in your business process knowledge that means how good you are in like you no know, supply chain because supply chain analytics is the tertiary knowledge that means like you no know, if you know very uh, if you are really grounded on your concepts then only you can apply supply chain analytics you just can't like you no know, run away by knowing the statistical techniques or some r programming or python and then you tell them saying that i am a supply chain analytics analyst guy kind of thing if you don't know like you know what are we going to do with the result how are you going to interpret and how it is going to like uh, what story it tells it is useless right like that means like you know your job is useless you are just a, a what you say tool to provide them like you know some service that's it okay so increasingly uh, increasingly i see like you know most of the students uh, supply chain guys like they wanted to take up a course on supply chain analytics because like there's a big hype in the market but uh, un you know fortunately or unfortunately like you know it is not the like you know the condition if once you know the supply chain processes very well you can do very well in the supply chain analytics it's not the other way around OK, so and also like you know, people say that like, OK, I'm good in supply chain analytics now, like, you know, I don't want like you no know, supply chain process knowledge or I, I need little bit of supply chain process. I do some internship for six months or like, you no know, three months. That is enough for me. That is also people say that to me, but I, I don't agree with the statement because whatever analysis they are giving it is going to be uh, uh, you know impacting on their bottom line so definitely you need to understand that why we are talking about geopolitical why we are talking about global trade it is not a subject directly linked with the supply chain that is what people perceive but it has got its own impact and everything so to me like the 50 percent of your decisions need to come from your data analysis or from your data story and 50% comes from your like experience, experience, your background, your concept, your like, you know, past experience on that particular phenomena or like, you know, your interactions with the market kind of thing. So the 50% decision only should come from your data. So data should give you some like, you know, leads or guidelines to for your like you know, decision making direction. Unfortunately, in, in India, this this uh, students are like you know, the the persons who wanted to shift their career also, uh, you know, have a different opinion on this. But uh, like uh, I'm seeing like uh, uh, increasingly I'm seeing the persons who were entered as a data analyst or supply chain analyst. Three years they are doing they are happy after that they are like no sir what am i doing i'm just doing like you no know, calculations 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 day in day out only i'm doing it i'm not the part of the process correct so that that gives them like no big big uh you know um uh what do you say like uh you know tiresome uh, look in their career so you have to have the supply chain background and the CSCP and CPIM would give you like you know, that kind of like you know, foundation knowledge or grounded knowledge about it. Definitely like uh, if you don't have a background about that, definitely CSCP and CPIM would give you, you know, that kind of knowledge. Yeah. Thank you very much. I agree with you so much that you know basic knowledge is first first thing which is required fundamental analytics comes later. Yeah. 
so I think we have already uh, 4.54 as per our time. Yeah, we uh, are six on minutes time. left. So I will have Nistush uh, ask if, if uh, anyone has any question. I think one participant, Melvin, had a question. He raised his hand, but I think he's disconnected now. So Nistush, are there any questions to ask? Yes, uh, first of all, thank you, Venkatesh, sir, for such an, a detailed informative session. Uh, we did have, uh, uh, we do have questions. In fact, uh, Mr. Melvis was also one of them, but he had to leave. He had messaged me that it was an important call. He had to leave. Uh, but we have one question from, uh, from Mr. Palin Sami. How Chinese Palin lockdown... Okay, Palin Okay. Mm. Yeah. So uh, how Chinese lockdown would affect global supply chain? And is it the right opportunity to India to uh, supply our make in India products? Yes, I did answer this I, question, I guess, like in my lecture itself, in my talk itself, like you know, India has a huge potential. OK, um, that is why, like, you uh, know, uh, knowing this or not, I don't know, like you know, Indian government has like, you know, taken the uh, huge initiative called making in india and definitely like you know making in it's not the one day job or one day affair or one year affair kind of it's a long term goal right like you know, the investment attractions or like the getting the new uh, factory setups new supply hubs it's completely a new game you know i'm telling you like you know it's a it's a uh, it takes its own sweet time but like uh, but we are showing lots of momentum um it, both in like you know policy as well as the investors uh, perspective okay so like to capture that many of the suppliers from india they wanted to cut down like you know, their operations in china as far as i concerned like you know especially in textiles and all they wanted to like you know cut down their operations they wanted to like you know bring back to like you know uh, vietnam and they wanted to like uh, set up their operations because vietnam is going to emerge as our competitor now, like so, Vietnam will have like lots of opportunities, and because like uh, traditionally, like now, Vietnam was enjoying the benefit of like the preferential treaty. Like you now, they were enjoying the game of like you know getting the preferential treatment from U.S. and European Union. So, like uh, you know, they they wanted to like you know leverage that opportunity, and they want to and in, and Vietnam also has like lots of investor friendly policies. So this this is going to continue. There's a tussle between like you no know, India and like you know uh, the China and Vietnam will continue for some time. Uh, in in fact, like you no know, Vietnam is emerging as a huge electronic hub also, electronics hub also. Okay, so like it is going to remain for some time, like you no know, three to five years. You, there are so much of exciting. Uh, geopolitical reordering is going to happen. So we will keep watching about it. It's just what we are seeing is the tip of the iceberg right now. Yeah. Perfect. So uh, we have another person who has raised a uh, hand. Uh, Bharat, you can unmute yourself and speak. Uh, hello, Professor. Uh, hello, Ravindra, sir. Hello. Hello, uh, hello, uh, Bharat. Uh, professor, uh, could you please tell your opinion about uh, Q-commerce like Gorillas and uh, Flink and uh, um, uh, Gettier? And I, w I wanted to know how long uh, uh, this Q-commerce uh, um, would sustain and uh, who is going to be uh, uh, who is going to sustain and who is going to be leader in the market. You gave some examples. Who are they? Uh, Flink, Gettier, Gorillas. Oh, OK. Oh, yeah, like see one. See my experience, I have around now 22 years of experience in logistics and supply chain. OK, so I'm my predominantly into global logistics. OK, not into the domestic logistic openly. I'm saying is, but like I still observe something. OK, uh, from the uh, that space also. Uh, one of the important elements which is happening like every uh, this is not an answer straight, uh, uh, answer straight to your question. OK, so I, I may not be able to tell you the uh, you know, right answer, but maybe like uh, you can get the idea from my answer. OK, every five years, the logistics domain is going to have a huge innovation. That means like consolidation is taking place. Like if you carefully observe like uh, 
uh, I'm not a person of typical academician, only talk about the theory kind of thing. But in practice, if you look back every five years back, you know, if you, if you track back the history, definitely you see like, you know, some disruptions are happening in the industry. So if you see that like five years back, like, you know, we had like, you know, emerging economies means like huge what is they like you know, e-commerce and also like the, the third party e-commerce service provider, e-commerce delivery service providers such as delivery and like, you know, your e-cart and everything which is happening kind of thing. So the innovations always happening in the logistics, one, one domain which is continuously into the innovation and it is focusing on the cost cut down uh, because they feel that like you know it is so difficult to cut down the cost at the logistics they feel that like the uh, three to four percent of the incoming and three to four percent of the outgoing so it's roughly around eight percent of your law eight to, if i agree if i'm right ravindra sir can talk about that right eight to ten percent right like logistics cost both inbound inbound and outbound on an industry front yeah absolutely whole industry. Yeah, i would say it, be, it can be a little bit more also yeah yeah, so eight to ten percent. I will keep it as an eight to ten percent because that's the industry I come from. So eight to ten percent. So the industries always wanted to like you know reduce it, but they don't have the ways. I'm telling you, they don't have the ways. Like it still remains as eight to ten percent. We are traditionally talking about eight to ten percent. Now also it is eight to ten percent kind of thing. So that, so you know maybe like ten cents they you know either here and there they reduce it. That's it. Like, but. Unfortunately, like you know, the, the technology front, I'm telling you the technology front, which is going to which is ruling right now, that would be like you know having a huge impact on this cost. Like you know, now like uh, the, the tracking cost, your warehouse inventory cost may get reduced because of the new innovation models. Okay, so we may get like you know in the down the line the, because of the digitalization of the entire supply chain, we may like get the revisions in terms of target cost into like you know, six to eight percent in terms of overall logistics cost. I'm kind of I'm talking about okay. So like I, to answer the question, yes, the logistics innovations are like you know always there, um, uh, and if you if you see that like you know domestic transports like you know nowadays it is like a third party third party contractor they are giving it you know third party again there will be another third party to them as well that means tier one tier two tier three contractors you know that is also emerging right now like that is always there in the industry but like you know that people are trying to adapt that as well you know? excellent uh thank you so much for that so uh, if anyone has any other question, you can unmute yourself and uh, just go ahead or if you can write in the chat box, we'll just give you a few seconds there. Correct. So if you don't have any question, uh, then we'll just close the session. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Ravi sir, for once again hosting the uh, SCM talk show. Thank you, Professor Venkatesh, for taking Thank your you. time. Coming to this uh, uh, wonderful uh, for the show and providing the wonderful insights. I'm sure the listeners have uh, a lot of things to learn uh, from the session today. Thank and, you so uh, much. Thank you. Thank you. So much. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you so yeah. much. Correct. Thanks. So and uh, and for all the participants, uh, we will have the next episode, which is the fifth episode on fourth of June, uh, on the same link at four p.m. IST. Uh, thank you so much for joining on Saturday, taking up your time. I hope you have learned and you have enjoyed the uh, show. If so, please do spread the word among your friends and colleagues. Follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and stay updated with the latest uh, upcoming trainings or the sessions. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe. Happy weekend. Thank you. Thank you. And thank happy you so weekend. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.